welcome to Behind the Lens, uh, a presentation of the Museum of Contemporary Photography at Columbia College Chicago. Uh, I'm Marissa Fox. I'm the Manager of Marketing and Community Engagement at the museum, and today it is my pleasure to welcome Akinbadi Akinbi. Akinbadi is a Berlin-based street photographer who is known worldwide for his images depicting life in global cities. In 2019, he was commissioned by the Chicago Architectural uh, Biennial and the School of the Art Institute of Chicago for a month-long residency in Holman Square in the Chicago neighborhood of North Lawndale. During this time, he hosted photography workshops with students, activists, and community members. Uh, the images he created during this residency, including Easy Like Sunday Morning, North Lawndale, were recently acquired by the MOCP. His work has been included in exhibitions around the world, including at Documenta 14, the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and the Goethe Institute, Johannesburg, South Africa, and many, many others. I'm so thrilled that he is here with us today. Uh, he will first share a presentation on some images, uh, which will be followed by a Q&A session. If you have questions, please enter them in the Q&A chat box, and I will monitor those, and he'll answer them following the presentation. Uh, so I'll now turn the floor over to Akinbadi. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today for MOCP Behind the Lens. Thank you very much, Marissa. I hope everybody can see me clearly. I greet everybody as well. And um, I just have to apologize a bit. I'm having a bit of difficulty, but I hope I can share the screen with you all and start my presentation. So wherever you are, all the very best. I hope you're all safe and sound and I'll start very soon. Just give me one second to share the screen. It should be it. Yeah, okay, off we go. Can everybody see this? I hope so. Yeah. But this, okay, yeah. So, ladies and gentlemen, I start off, I hope everybody can see. I'm, I'm not hearing anybody to say yes or no. Yeah, they have their sound disabled. Uh, you can put in the chat. I think that everyone okay. can hear you. You can put in the chat if, yeah. Okay, they can. They can hear. They can me. hear okay. you. Yeah. So, um, like Marissa said, I'm very much a, um, a street photographer, but not in the um, how can we put it? Not in the um, normal sense of the of the word street photographer. I'm more of a wanderer, a very conscious wanderer, trying to. Um, understand my wanderings and at the same time trying to um, look at, perceive, see, listen in to my environment. So um, I live here in Berlin, in, Germ in Germany, but I um, visit many um, different cities all over the world, mostly in Europe here, of course, in Africa, and of late also in the States. Huh? I've been to Chicago, to Philadelphia, some years ago I was in San Francisco. So now in my wanderings, I try to, um, to see in a very kind of um, in-depth manner, which means going beyond the superficial, trying to go in-depth into what is around me, around and about and above and below. So this was a, something I saw last year here in Berlin where a, a toilet had been thrown away onto the street, onto the pavement, or what in the States is called the sidewalk. And somebody else had written, um, fuck Duchamp. So I hope most of my listeners um, will know who Duchamp, Duchamp was, huh? a very sort of insightful artist at the beginning of the 20th century, I think in the 20s, 30s already. And he, was, um, he started this whole um, deal with ready-mades. Huh? So rather than you know, make art, he brought in um, banal things. Also, um, I, I believe he brought an epistle into the museum space and presented it as an art piece. So what I am trying to do here is to um, more or less recycle this <laughs> ready-made art idea, but what I too had seen on the sidewalk or on the streets. So this is part of my um, way of wandering and trying to see in depth. Okay, I'll go to the second image. This is at the beach in Lagos, 
few years ago. And it's part of a body of work called Sea Never Dry. It's about the sea, water, and um, the way we human beings interact with water in many different ways, depending on one's society and one's geographical space. In Lagos, which is around today, around 20 million um, inhabitants, we have no actual um, public um, um, space, open big space like a park, like Central Park in New York or Hyde Park in London. Or even now, this particular beach has also been, um, has been taken away, as, has been used as a building site for um, they're building a new city on the sea called Eco Atlantic City. So the beach has been closed off and that's where they store the building um, materials. So now this was some years ago and um, inhabitants from the city and uh, or further inland come to the beach, beach to look at the sea. Very few actually go inside the water, many can't swim. And also the sea current is very, very strong and it takes even the strongest swimmer sometimes out and they can't return. So there's this kind of open public space, which is a kind of conversation between us. So people who come to the, to the seaside, to the beach and the sea itself, which is constantly coming in and going out, go, coming in and going out. And this was, I believe during a um, Muslim festival Nigeria is um, a Christian Muslim, but also we have our own traditional religions as well, country. And um, this was during a, mu a Muslim festival, national festival. So um, people had time to come to the beach during the daytime and spend time there. But as you can see, many are just looking on and enjoying the, the sea breeze, very salty, and trying just to um, enjoy themselves. Sorry about this. I just don't know why I haven't been able to but we can still go through and it's working, which is good. Huh? The third image is a performance or um, <laughs> uh, probably quite a few of you can recognize the uh, mask of on the um, performer. It's um, Michael Jackson. This was around the 90s at the time. Some of his musics were very popular. And um, people in, this is again in, in near Lagos in Nigeria, were performing, so re-performing Michael Jackson's, um, so in those days, videos and his, his musical um, pieces, uh, his dramatic pieces. Uh, he was very, very popular then, and you had people putting on these masks and dancing like him, singing. You know, sometimes they would have his music on a, on a recording machine. And um, it was quite a very popular thing at that time. Huh? I often wonder today how um, those who were very um, drawn towards him were fans of his, how they now consider him, considering all that has been said since then, said and um, filmed and made about him since then. So you see now, again, this is um, interestingly a, a bit of um, what one would say a white face on a black body, but the whole performance and you can see a bit of the um, people in the background and these two people here, this man here and this man here, they're actually performers, twins, who were performing and uh, trying to encourage the crowd to get into the, into the groove, as they would say. Yeah? So we come to the fourth image. So I deliberately chose my images to be very sort of um, all over the place in a way to confuse you all. At the same time, to give you an idea of how wide ranging my, foot, my uh, wanderings are and what I am trying all the time to work on, to see and to say. So this particular image is from a high rise. I was staying in a flat on the 12th floor in an art deco building built around the 20s, 30s in Johannesburg. Johannesburg is a, um, the, the largest city in um, South Africa. It's a gold mine, or at least was a gold mining city and a lot of its wealth comes from the gold mines. 
And um, you see here from the 12th floor, a kind of street canyon, no? or, or almost like a valley. And actually there's a mini buses, most of them, returning back to the townships, especially Soweto in the evening. Because in the downtown area where I was staying, um, black people now live there in, in quite a lot. Huh? But when Johannesburg was conceived and later on during the apartheid years, um, the whites, South Africans, um, separated themselves from black South Africans and other Africans from other elsewhere. And they put the black Africans in townships or you know, far from the inner city. But as apartheid became untenable in the seven, especially in the 80s, um, whites started moving out of the inner city more towards the, what they felt were the safer northern suburbs of Johannesburg. And then blacks moved into the inner city, which, where it's now predominantly black, actually. But in the evening, many of them don't live in the inner city. They still live in the townships. So they return back to the townships in these minibuses. There's also a, a proper bus um, service and also a train service as well, or train services. So you see this image from um, up quite high up in what I would call the valley or a canyon, so to speak. So one thing which I'm really concerned with is trying to understand my surroundings. I said this already, but primarily also, what is a photograph? What is it I am trying to make? to take and to, yeah, to, to get across, so to speak. What is, yeah, what is a photograph? Obviously, for many people, it's a piece of paper. Uh, I, 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 my images are analog images, so they're um, silver-based, silver gelatin-based, and they convey a dimension which, if you look on the piece of paper, you get into depth. So, so you see many other layers, so to speak. Most non uh, uh, West Africans, especially, or, or those who have not been to Africa, will not really understand this image because it says urgent photo hair. But where is hair? It's just arrows pointing, one pointing downwards, one pointing more towards the left. This particular image was made in, uh, some years ago in the um, area of Lagos where a lot of um, embassies are. So sometimes if you want a visa and you don't have a passport photograph, you come to this particular spot and there's a photograph, a photographer uh, around and he makes a digital image of you and prints it out quickly. This, that's why urgent, because to get the photograph is urgent and the photographer is here, but you can't see him. So now there's so many different layers that people walking past, there's a car go, I'm going in the other direction, there's a building behind. So, uh, but this thing is urgent, huh? is it the photograph itself which is urgent? So my photograph, or the people walking by, or the car, or the hair, what, where is hair, where is there? So these are the kind of questions. I hope I'm not sounding too um, humoristic or pedantic. Huh? I'm so sorry about this bit awkward way of showing you the images, but I hope you're enjoying them. So I am presently have a, a major retrospective show here in Berlin and um, it's called Six Songs Swirling Gracefully in the Taut Air. And one of the key images in this show is in the first room, that's where the first song is being sung. And that, that first room, the title of the images is Photography, Tobacco, Sweets, Condoms, and Other Configurations. So what I'm trying to do, to, do, to say, to show in that first room is actually what are photographs at the same time Addressing the question of tobacco, which I, I don't smoke. I'm a, actually, I'm a, I'm a bit of an anti-tobacco, um, especially the way it's um, produced as cigarettes. And then condoms, because here, especially in Germany, they have condomats where you can 
put in money and get a condom out. And they also have sweet machines. And often these condom mats and the sweet machines and the tobacco machines quite near to, next to each other. I was thinking I'd, when in my wanderings in the States, I never actually saw tobacco machines. Although I think there are some, but I'm not sure. Because I, the, um, I think um, in the States, they're a bit more strict about smoking now. And then, of course, the other configurations can be any and everything. This particular image has as the cent central point here is Okwi and Wezo, who has since passed, and who was an internationally very um, well-recognized curator. He came from Nigeria, but lived most of his adult life in the States, and achieved a lot in a very short time. He passed on in his early 50s, and this, he was giving um, or opening a big um, exhibition called um, Short Century in the same building where today I am showing my images. And um, so he was giving the opening speech. And behind him is a photograph of Princess Alexandra and Abubakar Tafawa Balewa, so it's Princess Alexandra next to her, at the um, evening celebrations or the, yeah, the celebrations of our independence in Nigeria in October 1960, the 1st of October 1960. So the short century was very much about, is, is, is specific to Africa, um, our color, co uh, times of, of being uh, colonized and then our independence and uh, thereafter in photographs. So this particular photograph within the photograph is again referencing my concern about what is a, photo a photograph. So you see all these different layers coming together. And also I um, wanted to show this particular image because over the years I got, or I and others got quite close to Okwin Weza. And um, we went to see him about two months, yeah, about no, six weeks before he passed on. He was at that time, the director of the, um, What's it called again? Um, the house, the, the house of art, the house der Kunst in Munich. But he was already um, very ill, so he was in the intensive station in a hospital in Munich. He had cancer, and so we had to put on what we would now call PPE, so really uh, protective clothing, because we we couldn't infect him, because he was in in the intensive station in the in the, in the hospital. But he was still so happy to see us and so you know, ebullient, he, he, he engaged us, spoke with us for two hours. In fact, he did most of the talking, was really very happy. Unfortunately, though, six weeks later, he passed on. So in the first room definitely is a kind of um, homage to him, but the whole exhibition as well. So again, um, in my wanderings, I'm always trying to be here in the present, in the here and now, I'm looking back, but also looking forward. Marissa, is it going okay? Yeah, it looks great. And Thank everyone you. is saying they're really enjoying the images in the chat. Okay. So the next image, I return again to Johannesburg, this time to Soweto. This is a township southwest of Johannesburg. That's why Soveto, Southwest, so S O V A, the W E, um, uh, to, T O is township, Southwest township. So it's, it's actually has more people living there now than Johannesburg itself. And you have areas of Soweto where they have, I mean, really rich, I mean, millionaires, huh? shopping malls, things like that. But also have other areas where, unfortunately, a lot of poverty and um, impoverishment. Huh? So this was, again, uh, I was there one day and uh, a group of tourists, because now they have this, which, something which I, I'm a bit, well, in fact, I'm very much against, what they call township tourism, like almost like slum tourism, which also happens as well. So tourists who come from elsewhere, come to this particular country, in this case, South Africa, and then go on a, uh, on a big bus to the township to see the township. And they have a museum there, which is a, um, talks about the apartheid years. 
And so there's an image here, I hope you can all see it quite well, here in the middle ground. It's of the um, Soveto uprising of school children in 1976. And in this particular photograph taken by a photographer on the ground at, at that time, a, a black South African photographer, is um, the, one of the first um, school children to be actually killed by the, because the, um, the police then to, to um, suppress the demonstration um, started using live ammunition. The demonstration was against the implementation of Afrikaans as a language of teaching in all schools. So the school children rose up and said, no, this is, this is just too much. And this led to years and years of demonstrations and protests and actually physical fighting until eventually apartheid was overturned and a democracy returned or came back to South Africa. It was never really there before. So you see again now, I'm standing behind the tourists. In some ways, I'm also a kind of tourist, but I was actually, in my, in my wanderings, came upon the situation. I returned to Berlin, and um, the photograph, of a poster and I took a, a fragment of the poster with the words can't be silent in the middle ground you see some black so Africans actually um, playing music on the microphone in the foreground uh, a, a white person on, on the guitar and this was a film made by um, white musicians together with refugee musicians who were living in, re in uh, um, refugee homes in Germany and couldn't get work. Huh? So they went to the refugee homes, found out who were musicians, and together they made a film and music. And the film was quite successful. It's called Can't Be Silent. Huh? It has a particular um, resonance in, in light of what has been happening of late, huh, where again, especially black people have risen and said we can't be silent and we can't take all this um, suppression and indignation. But and this was a film together with white people made then. What was interesting for me was, again, this is what I call serendipity. I was being filmed in the exhibition space about three months ago and the cameraman um, for television, huh? a television interview, and the cameraman doing was the, um, the cameraman of this film, very interestingly. Huh? So he, he was quite surprised to see this fragment of, of, of the film. He, had, um, he, way, he was a cameraman many years before. And then his daughter rang him during the interview, television interview, and his daughter at school was looking at the film that particular day. So again, all these kind of things came together. So this is part of what I'm very sensitive to, how threads, which we often can't see, come together in their weaving and manifest themselves. And if I'm fortunate enough, I can try to take or make an image. I deliberately say take or make as opposed to shoot, which I, the word or the term I don't like because it has a very militaristic and for me very neg it's negatively um, is negatively possessed. Here we have an image I made in Chicago last year in the room, or actually it's a kind of museum, a very small office space of a wonderful historian in the um, library in Chicago, the, the a former um, central library in Chicago. And he has been collecting these um, they're not posters, yeah, they're posters as well, but also um, what is been um, stuck onto um, bottles and um, you know, um, creams and so on uh, over the years. Uh. So this was a particular um, company making these kind of creams and other um, cosmetics. It's, apparently it was a Jewish um, entrepreneur, but making these um, creams and, and other cosmetics for um, African-Americans. Uh. 
and the, the actually the the person who did these um um this designing of this particular um poster or placard was um an african american as well and you can see how um times have changed so to speak that in in this particular thing you see the straightened hair also of the man not just the woman of course but what fascinated me was the the play with many different words lucky brown bright skin but especially vanishing cream because implied is that if you put on this cream you would vanish or of course the skin your skin will get lighter but it's interesting that at one time as and unfortunately still especially in, in now in africa some people black people like to lighten the skin because they think or feel it's, it makes them more beautiful or they are more attractive to others, you know, male or female, because men also do it as well. And um, what's fascinating is the concept of banishing, of disappearing, just like literally, you know, no longer being there. Back again in Berlin. So in my exhibition, Six Songs, one particular room is, is called African Quarter. And the African Quarter is a quarter here in Berlin, uh, what the Americans would call a neighborhood, where about 120, 30 years ago, that's the end of the 19th century, a circus magnate, I believe from Hamburg, wanted to open up in Berlin a zoo that's beyond the city boundaries then. See, Berlin was much smaller then, but already expanding. So he wanted to open up a zoo where he would show exotic animals, uh, that, uh, of course, from Africa, but also from South America, and other, but also human beings. Huh? And the human beings would come from the colonies, to the German colonies then, and they had colonies in Africa and a few, uh, one or two in the South Seas, and, but they also would have tried to bring in, of course, um, uh, other exotic peoples like Native Americans and so on. Fortunately, very fortunately, the, the plan didn't come into being because Berlin was expanding so much because of industrialization, the then city um, local government took over the land and started building houses, residential houses, not just the city, but also private, um, people as well. So um, here in Germany, they, they give the streets when they st um, open up a new area, first numbers, and then they start giving, giving them names, street names. So they named this particular area after the African colonies initially, Cameroon Street, Togo Street, Guinea Street, Congo Street. So in Cameroon and Togo, this, those were German colonies. Congo, the Germans had aspirations, Guinea as well. And, some, and they named other streets also from particular geographical areas and so on. So that was one particular area where I did, a, I've been photographing over the years, I keep on going there. I mean, this was an area not for Africans, it was for Germans, huh? mostly, especially working class, but also it's lower middle class, and they're still there today. But this particular image is not in the African quarter, although I put it together with the other images, because this particular um, pathway uh, is called, or path, Martin Luther King Path, or way. It's another part of Berlin, Buko, uh, but it's in the East, former East Berlin. Huh? And it was very interesting that in the West of Berlin, they had this African quarter, and they've kept, they've kept the street names. Later, when Hitler came to power after 1933, the fascists added, before then, but also after, thereafter, after 1933, they added some, the names of, um, the family names of three colonial, so German co colonists, one or two of whom were very, very brutal. And the names have, uh, since the Second World War, have been very contested, and hopefully they'll be removed sometime soon. They want to change the names of these particular three streets. And in the east of Berlin, they, um, because of their social, um, socialist um, ideology especially, but they were very aware of what was happening elsewhere in the world, especially the civil rights movement in the States. So they have this Martin Luther King um, way as a, um, 
on honoring Martin, the, the, the legacy of Martin Luther King. And also they have another street called Paul Robeson Street, honoring the legacy of Paul Robeson, who was a great singer and um, act, um, certain civil rights activist, even before Martin Luther King in the 50s, 40s, 50s. So what I like in particular about this image, Martin Luther King, but it's, it's a young, a very young white boy stepping forward or running forward. And again, this kind of serendipity because I heard him coming from behind, so wait until he came into the image, he kept, continued on, on his way. And in the background, you have the high rises. These were built in the um, former East Berlin after the war. Because I mean, the, the war was so terrible on Berlin, many buildings were destroyed. So there was a big building boom or uh, um, rebuilding after the Second World War. Here we have another image. Now this, this particular image is in the African Quarter of the neighborhood, African Quarter. It's called African Quarter um, in, in um, Berlin here. This was taken about you know, almost yeah, 16, 18 years ago. And maybe a few of you will recognize in the background on the billboard is Carl Lewis one of the first black male uh, models um, here in Germany. So the Germans, <laughs> uh, this is it. Now it's a very, con um, what's the word? It's something we, um, we are all being sensible, um, um, sensitized about what's, what's, what's been happening recently in the States. But I mean, racism is widespread huh? and very, very strong here in Europe as well. It expresses itself in different forms, but in one particular form was that they were very hardly. In fact, I've been in Germany now 50 years. When I first came, there was no uh, advertisements or billboards with black people on them. Started coming around the 80s with people like Naomi Campbell, um, and also a bit later, um, Carl Lewis. Huh? I think he was at that time. It started with Nike, if I, if I get it, if I remember rightly. Huh? This particular image is again serendipity. Many people are fascinated because the young, young man in the foreground is doing in another kind of way, the same kind of hand movement as Carl Lewis in the background. But this happened, I didn't say anything, it just happened. And then I was fortunate enough <laughs> to be standing there. This is what I mean about the weaving of the threads, how things come together. The next millisecond, nanosecond is all over, it's gone again. But this is not um, like Cartier-Bresson's idea of the, um, what's the word, a decisive moment. I'm not into that at all. It's rather this coming together of, of the threads. They manifest themselves for, for sometimes for minutes or for a few seconds, and then keep on, keep on, the weaving continues all the time. So this image, is, I'm back in Lagos. This is the Catholic cathedral built by returnees from Brazil. Not this particular building, then, not then. This was built a bit later, but um, it was the first building is been taken down and this was built also by retur um, returnees from Brazil about a hundred years ago. And these returnees from Brazil were former slaves who got their freedom, one of the last countries to give freedom to their slaves. 1888, and as soon as they got their freedom, some slaves in Brazil, especially that's in the Northeast, they hired, they chartered ships then, and came back to West Africa to return home. And they came back with, um, uh, especially, um, you know, they, 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 they had not been working in plantations like many of the slaves in the States, but they had been working in the cities as um, craftspeople, carpenters, um, bricklayers, builders, um, working on building sites and so on. So they came back with these um, ab abilities and put them into good use as, as a form of living in West Africa, especially in the port cities, of which Lagos was one of the major um, return um, ports. So um, this particular um, 
of a cathedral was I think around about 80 to 100 years built ago. And um, I've often walked past and this day I was very fortunate to see it almost like a ship moving through the urban space. And so you have in the foreground the cars and the, um, this, this here is a kind of, um, how do you call them in English? Um, it's a kind of three-wheeled um, taxi. And then you see all the, the what I call the scattering of the, the um, wiring from, from, the, uh, from above and the palm tree. But the ship seems to be, sa uh, the, 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 the cathedral seems to be sailing through. So again, for me, this particular moment, seeing it and it being, pre being pre prepared and willing also, I really wanted to, to take, make this image. I have often shot, uh, or now I'm using the word shooter, huh? I have often made images of, of the cathedral, but this for, for me was one of my most successful. So Christianity was brought to us by missionaries, especially from, from Britain, so at least in Nigeria. I mean, other missionaries went to other parts of Africa, from France, from Germany as well, from all the, um, the, the colonizing countries. Huh? But we have our own um, um, forms and also especially our own religions. Huh? And it comes together, like in this particular image, this is the crowning of the King of Lagos. This is him here in the, underneath the umbrella with his, with his staff stuff of authority and it, our own ways so of our culture and our languages of course and also our religions are still very much there very strong but unfortunately um, this sort of overlay of christianity and also islam and other um, modern forms of thinking and being which somehow have suppressed us and no longer allow us to be how we, our own path of development. But it's still, it's still trying to come out. And so I'm very, very inter much interested in these kind of things. And I happened to be in Lagos at this particular time when the king of, this king was being um, coronated. Huh? So get, coming into power. And it was quite a so powerful experience. You can see the crowd, people here in the background. And it's, it's, very, it's very crowded. Um, Lagos has a very humid temperature, can be very, very hot and muggy. But no problem, just mixing in and trying to again take, make the image. And this was a particular moment where the king with his entourage, you know, just mostly men. There is also a queen, not necessarily his wife, but a, a leading lady of Lagos as well. This is one thing which was which the colonizers really destroyed. That the women had a, a, as almost an equal power to the men. But when the colonizers came, they they favored the men to the detriment of the women. So nowadays, women have to almost literally refight back for their positions which they used to have before. Interestingly, though, some of the major markets in West Africa are not just are, let, are, are run by women, not men. So another room of, from the six songs, the six songs um, refer to actually to each room. So the six rooms, six songs. Huh? So this is a particular image, which I also showed you for early in the beginning, um, another, another image from the Sea Never Dry series. Huh? This was some years ago on the beach, in the, which is now unfortunately been um, closed off. And two Europeans, uh, an elderly couple sitting and just, you know, just chilling and watching what is going by. Again, the kind of the moment of being there and being fortunate enough to see these things coming together and also moving apart as well. And um, what so many people can't quite fully understand because at what, uh, as from about the 80s onwards, Lagos got a very bad reputation as being very dangerous, lawless, a lot of crime and criminality and so on. 
But yet you still had people, and this is your older couple, felt quite comfortable to come to the beach. They have no guards around them. They had no weapons or anything. Just sitting down and just watching. And then later on, getting a bit dark, they get up and go home. So, I mean, like, <laughs> Like everywhere in the world, you, you, sometimes even in conflict areas at times, some people still realize, okay, I don't want to do this, get involved in all this criminal, or I don't want to become a victim, or actually to become a part of the people who are doing the crime. Just live my own quiet, peaceful life. Huh? So I particularly like this image. Huh? come back again into the nitty gritty of what I call downtown Lagos. Lagos actually is a lagoon city. It's a city built around lagoons. So we have Lagos Island and then the mainland. And Lagos Island is actually a series of islands. Now the islands have almost become one because they've filled up the lagoons or the waterways, the causeways. But this used to be, still is actually the the center of Lagos Island. And I'm standing on the rubble of a building which was pulled down illegally, a, a former um, building built by returnees from Brazil, which was a, quite an iconic building. I'm looking towards the um, central business district, the CBD, which is almost on the um, shoreline, so on the Atlantic coast. Uh, around the 70s and 80s, it no longer became the same. <laughs> People moved to another part of Lagos, but now they're returning also back to the central business district. And so it's quite a, um, like all cities, um, neighborhoods come and go, change, are gentrified, uh, become, you know, sort of middle class areas or, or slumish areas and then are regentrified. There's all kinds of things happening all the time. So this is one. Reason, particular reason why I especially like wandering cities. Um, seeing, experiencing, and sometimes trying to take, make images of this constant changing, evolving, constantly redefining themselves. This is quite a jump, huh? So the next image, please don't be shocked. But this has to do in the first room, which I mentioned about photography, tobacco, sweets, condoms, and other configurations. So one thing which has fascinated me actually most of my life is um, the way in cities, especially the eroticization of, of public space and private space. Huh? So there's a lot of, um, in fact, there's a lot of money <laughs> to be made in marketing in all kinds of different ways, erotic, one could also almost mix it up with exotic, but also sexuality. So now for years, I've been meaning to go to, there's a big erotic affair here in Berlin every year, once a year. And I've been meaning to go for the last 20 years, <laughs> never made, I went last year for the first time. And these, it's, I mean, I hope you can all see this from the image. These are actually um, mannequins or um, so plastic, um, almost avatars or look alike, like human beings. But in the background, this um, statement of, of, um, of, of, of real sex. So now the question is, what is real? What is unreal? Or what is... Yeah, what is visible, like with the visible, invisible cream, or what is invisible. So all the time in photographs, I'm trying to, yeah, I'm trying to um, thematize these, these problems, also trying to see them and look at them and trying to understand them. So this particular image was really fascinating for me and um, something I've been working on, oh, but um, I'll show some other images coming up, but, um, all over the world. So um, this desire of us to, especially in our private lives, huh, to, to express ourselves, but not fully knowing what it's all about. Huh. Well, another thing which fascinates me is that um, this um, virtual world is 
becoming so strong that very soon we will not be able to tell the difference between a real so human being and the copy of the human being or the I forget the word now there's a word a particular word for it um no, it's not avatar it's um but anyway so but you know so an artificial human being yeah? and so they they be moving together in, apparently even in Japan and some few other countries especially some men have apparently um left their wives for these kind of um, virtual um, dolls. Another form of this, uh, of this virtual uh, um, world but in this case, actually dress mannequins or mannequins which are um, actually being sold on the streets of Lagos for people who want to have a, um, a textile shop. Huh? What I found interesting, I didn't see it immediately in this particular image, is the, um, the, the, um, the way the man on the extreme left, his hand, um, corresponds to the um, lady next to him with her hand. Huh? So this later I saw in, in on the in the contact sheets and found it so fascinating. Also, of course, you know the lack of a particular head or this kind of thing. So it's all these things all the time. Interestingly, at this particular, um, this is a very crowded market in the center of Lagos Island, Balogun Market, and next door was also another shop full of mannequins. And I asked the lady who was there, and I asked to make a image. She shouted back at me, no. <laughs> so anyway, I left quietly and went to the next shop, and the man allowed me to um to 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 take make this image. Marissa just said that the um internet is unstable. Can you still see the image? Yeah, I can see the image. Your sound was breaking up uh, for a second, but I think it's okay now. Okay. So as you've probably already got it, um, signage, billboards, graffiti, the writing on the walls fascinate me. Huh? This is a particular billboard some years ago, and this is about um, um, you know giving money to um, for um, development in the so-called um, underdeveloped world. Huh? But somebody had written then, you know, fuck your, your money, huh? which I found very appropriate, especially with a smile and also in the image is also holding up his photograph. So this is the kind of way I try to read these signs, these images, um, these um, billboards, this graffiti on the wall, signage. Um, I like to refer to the Bible. I'm not a, a particularly a Bible uh, person, but there's this um, thing about the writing on the wall. It's a kind of warning, meaning, to a particular city or to our time. And if you can, you can, you can actually read these signs and possibly get an inkling of what is to come. I hope I'm making sense. So here we have Sorry, I haven't shown up down here. We have um, another scene from Lagos. This is quite near actually the, um, the Catholic Cathedral. In the middle ground is a, um, a one story um, former, now it's been dilapidated, dilapidated, falling apart, Brazilian, um, so built by Brazilian returnees. And then in the foreground, or a bit more in the middle to foreground, a um, completely uh, sort of um, <laughs> deconstructed um, three-wheel taxi. But for me, the two young boys in their school uniform walking past them, some people remark they're very clean and the uniform. The uniform is actually a, um, a replica from the colonial times. The British brought this uniform and this kind of schooling to us, uh, and we've continued with it. Uh. 
So this is the kind of reference to my own um, upbringing where I too had to wear uniform at times. I was going to such schools, but in my time, this is many decades ago, Lagos was actually on a, in a better state. Uh, I mean, not so many dilapidated houses and so on. Things that are improving though, I mean, but it it's, can be time consuming. And also <laughs> for some very, very difficult times. So I return to one of my um, major um, themes, what is a photograph? Huh? And this is a kind of sort of almost like an installation of a photo booth, what the states, it's a photo automat. I've never actually seen photographs coming out of this particular photo booth in Berlin here. You see all the graffiti written on it and somebody moving past. But um, what I do like it though is this kind of constant reinterpretation of a particular um, theme, especially the photo booth, which was a kind of precursor of the selfie, where now people have the photo booth in their hands in their, in their mobile phones. So they're constantly making portraits or, of downloading portraits of themselves, self, selfies. But the photo booths are quite popular here in Berlin, and most of them, um, they're called actually photo automatic, but not spelled with F, with PH, and they've come from the States or from Canada. And they've been installed here, about 19 to 20 of them are quite popular, quite cheap as well. Most of them black and white, analog, one or two digital and one or two color as well. I do believe they have them in the States, but I, haven't, I didn't see any in Chicago, did I? I, I did, I did, I, but there's, yeah, I saw them in the underground in uh, one of the um, subway stations in Chicago. So what really upsets me, and I think now people understand it more, much better, is this constant dehumanizing and sort of dumbing down black people. So these are, um, this, is a, this is a recent image taken last year in Austria, advertising or a billboard trying to um, you know, say that, you know, um, um, I think it's for um, one of the children um, organizations, you know, trying to improve things for children. But then the way it's been done is so, I mean, it's just, I mean, it's actually, actually I, I find it very racist. I mean, I just, sometimes I can't get it into my head that the people who actually design this kind of thing can't see what, actually what they're doing. And um, in, in the woman, she's an actress, apparently, she's holding this particular kind of glow and within it, this smiling face of a young black um, boy. Yeah? And it's so, I mean, what, I mean, okay, I'm standing in front of this, taking, making this image, other white people, because it's in Austria, <laughs> walking past me. And if you understand that I'm actually quite annoyed by this kind of thing, others walk past and say, yeah, you know, it's, that's how it is. Or, or they don't even know, actually notice what I'm doing, uh, this kind of thing. But so very bad and these are the kind of things which must stop some countries don't do this anymore fortunately i don't i hope they don't do it in britain anymore don't know about france but in germany you occasionally you still get it in austria it's, i mean it's, it's very bad and this is the thing which makes them when when people start talking about institutionalized racism and embedded racism people don't want to talk about but here it is here, here's a clear um example of it an image from Sao Paulo. Very much into this kind of buzz of the streets. But as I said again, please, I am not a street photographer as, as such. I'm more of a wanderer trying to actually understand the street and my surroundings, but not just the street. Even, for example, in this particular place, the hotel in the background, the uh, traffic lights, the signage, the lady in the foreground 
it all comes together. But also this post as well here, the, the lamp post or um, yeah, the post there in the front. So, but this particular image I put here because the next one is, is gives it, a, it gives it more of a reference. Yeah. So we're still in Sao Paulo, but now I've, many things come together. Um, the man on the phone, you know, it's no big deal, but here you have the sweet machine again. Huh? So my sweets theme, and then you have the photos, the internet. So, and all, so many things happening all together in one particular image. I was, I'm fortunate, happy to get, take, make this particular image. So it says something about our times. And also what fascinates me is how we've taken so quickly to the world. They become so ubiquitous that we don't even think about it anymore. But I grew up where nobody had a mobile phone and phones were actually fixed. So I mean, the, within the house, so if the phone rang, you went to the phone, the phone didn't come or move with you. Fascinating, huh? fascinating. So these are the kind of things where we times change, we change, but we don't fully, at least I feel often, we don't fully realize what's happening. So yeah, so now, This is back in Berlin and on the left, the sweet machine. And on the right, for those in the know, this looks like a tobacco machine where you put in money and get a packet of um, cigarettes out, but it's not, it's a condo mat. Yeah? So this is um, trying, just trying to, this, this particular image is in the show. I'm trying to show, say that what's happening, huh? that these, these machines are for children. Huh? The condomats, are they for children too? They're, they're next to each other. So are they for children too? And is this what makes us consumers? You know, that one second I'm putting in money to get some, um, this um, uh, sweet machines is mostly for chewing gum, some kind of bubble gum or all kinds of very, I've never ever tried it, but they don't look very unpleasant kind of chewing gum. And next to it, these, these condomats. Huh? So again, but it's not just only that, it's also the, the vegetation and the background and also the kind of, maybe you see the, the, um, the stickers on the machines on both and also the graffiti sometimes. And this particular machine has been, um, been damaged a bit. Huh? So some people sometimes try to break into that, which fascinates me. Huh? Marisa, I hope I haven't been talking for too long. I've, I've almost finished. Huh? Yeah, we have a couple of questions, but whenever you're ready, um, you can wrap up. Mm -hmm. So here, I return to Johannesburg, I believe for the last image, and a moment again of serendipity. I was really trying to, to see the shadow, the shadow play, the stop sign, and then also the, the um, this particular thing, because again, presently, this was um, two years ago in Johannesburg, uh, there's a, the, the, the people are very, um, feel very um, insecure in Johannesburg. There's a lot of crime, random crime, and sometimes very bad, you know, um, deliberate, horrible, so breaking into houses and, you know, um, raping, killing, and also, you know, taking away your property. So I'm wondering in a particular neighborhood, it's more or less mixed, um, middle class, I would say. And then a jogger comes past, a, a, young, a young man jogging. So the things come in together. So again, I'm trying to say that it's not, it's not for everybody is so, so dangerous. And I'm wandering around with the camera, all my equipment, but I don't feel endangered as such. So to the jogger, and even at night, I, I would still do this. I don't, I don't see anybody jogging around at night though, because people get even more a bit um, afraid. Um, so then the next image is a kind of comment on this particular image. I hope nobody will be upset by it because um, it's in some ways very sexist. Huh? So this was about two years ago, the, the billboard advertising the um, ex, um, erotic mess, um, fair here in Berlin. Huh? And so you see these four ladies 
in a very kind of intimate um, uh, photographic pose, but somebody had, you know, the um, audacity, or you know, I don't know how you can call it, to put this um, signage chair and then the Me Too sign, which was quite um, at that time two years ago was uh, you know uh, something it was which was for many people's minds, but um, for years these particular um, billboards advertising the erotic um, fair have often been um, destroyed, pulled out, especially by activists or so women who are very much against the whole idea of this um, so like pornographic, erotic thing. And this particular image I found very sort of um, prescient while, in, you know, with the whole side chair, but also the graffiti and, and the weight. And I've taken it, just a fragment again. Huh? So all the while it's wandering, looking, taking in, and trying to understand, or I like the word to overstand, huh? to, to get into a, you know, a, a, um, a real deeper understanding of what is happening. As in this image, which is a photo booth, but this is actually more of a so-called, I would call them more professional, where you can actually use these particular uh, photo booths to um, get your passport um, image made. Huh? And I believe the government of today, they even accept them for the biometric um, pass passport images. This one is, is in Berlin here, in a particular subway, which sometimes gets, it gets quite, it get, you can, can see the, the curtain has been torn, graffiti inside, all kinds of stuff. And so, and so I often check it out and see what's happening. And this was a particular moment where I felt that there was a kind of correspondence between this space within the curtain and the, the face here. But I mean, I don't impose my ideas on my audience. I just hope that the audience get it in the sense that they, they too look at the images and try to understand and come to their own um, conclusions, their own, you know, develop their own ideas, their own narratives as well. So just two more images and then it's be, uh, be finished. Yeah. So this again is one of my um, main themes. This is what they call a garden dwarf, I believe. Is it, how do they call them in English? Um, Marissa, do you know the name? The garden gnome. Garden gnome, thank you very much. Huh? So they sell these things here in Germany, but not with the black phaser, huh? and across the border in Poland. Huh? And there apparently they have some, they sell some with black phaser. Huh? So I saw this last year and I was really shocked. Because I've never ever, I've, not, I've known about the, I've seen them around for years and years and years because small gardens, so urban gardening, is a bit different name here, but um, in Germany, is very popular. And some people, they have the actual, um, their own um, little plot of land and they install um, garden gnomes in this little plot of land. Not everybody, some people. But the, most, or most of the garden gnomes have white faces. But these particular ones now are becoming quite popular, especially across the board in Poland. And I saw this one in a courtyard here in Berlin. And I mean, again, this whole question, I mean, why are they doing this? What's, what's the meaning? What's the message? I haven't fully found out. I, I do my research, but I haven't actually found out where they're being made or why they actually, what, what they're trying to say, what they're trying to get across. And then, but again, in making, Taking this image, I included all the other things as well. So the, the, the um, ladder, which for me is a, a reference to the ladder upwards or in the Bible, again, the, the heavenly ladder. So to more understanding, more learning. So in all my wanderings, all my work, I'm trying all the time to understand more, to see more, understand more. Of course, I realized that there is no end to understand. I mean, the, the journey always is a constant, on, always on, on moving forward uh, journey. Huh? So ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. I come to the very last image. I hope I have not bored you. And yeah, and I hope you all have a little bit of understanding now where I'm coming from, where I'm trying to go to. So this is the last one. This is quite interesting. I said where I'm trying to go to because 
Um, here in Germany, we have these things, which, what they call takeaway, takeaway coffee, takeaway um, snacks and so on. And they call it to go, to go. So like here, to go. Yeah. But this is actually a photographic studio or yeah, studio in uh, Mali, in Bamako, Mali. There's a um, country, in a, a landlocked country in West Africa, the capital actually, Bamako. And um, I happened to be at this particular moment and this cart going, this donkey drawn cart going by and the studio, but it's not, um, it's the studio, the photographer came from the country called Togo, not to go, but many people here in Germany read it as to go, it's so funny. Huh? And you see all the signage again. And also my question, what is a photograph? Is the photograph about the donkey, about the photographer, about his, his clients, about the, um, the people on the cart looking back, which for me is a wonderful moment because in looking back, it's as if you're trying to see what is coming from behind, looking back into the past. In the front here, yeah, at least towards our, our left. Huh? So I thank you all very much. I hope I have not bored you. And I hope you have some interesting questions to ask. And please, I, I, please, I, um, I, um, I apologize for my awkward way of showing the images. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. That was wonderful. Um, we really, that was a really incredible presentation. And thanks for correcting me with the street photographer. You're more of a wandering photographer. And some of the questions um, actually deal with some of that um, that you discussed previously. So I'll, I can read you the first question um, that was asked actually even before you began your presentation by Rick Tardiff in Florida. And he wrote, in recent years, there have been restrictions placed on what and who can be photographed in public places. So Berlin, Germany, he believes is a location that has made it difficult for street photographers. Um, his question is, how has this affected your work? What difficulties have you faced personally and how has it changed your approach? I, I am aware of these um, new regulations, so to speak, or more uh, stricter regulations. Um, I believe you can, you can take, make an image in the public space of groups of people, of people you know, um, you know, on the street. But if you come in close, you, ha you have to get their permission. I still do my, my, my way of photography. If somebody um, obviously doesn't want me to take their, take their photograph, I don't take the photograph. Unless, of course, I really want to um, uh, make a portrait of them, then I will ask them. And Actually, the majority are, ready, are willing to have their portrait taken, but some not. And so I, I always respect that. Um, there are moments like um, demonstra demonstrations, street parades, street parties uh, before Corona, <laughs> um, other things where um, there is a kind of free license to photograph. Huh? So, I mean, it's, it's, it's a very difficult situation. And then in the subway, in, in um, so semi-private spaces like shopping malls, uh, you know, it's, it's a give and take. Huh? Most people don't actually mind. It's my, my, my own um, experience, but some do, especially some ladies. It's very strange. They start shouting at me at times. Huh? Again, recently, again here, but on the street. But I just, I mean, I don't photograph them, but I, I just, I don't, I don't engage with them either at that time. Huh? And um, recently, this was just, this was actually when Corona had already started, I went to a lakeside with some other friends, African friends and some German friends. And we were walking, most of us had cameras, so we were walking around. The police came, not because of us, but because of um, social distancing. This was at the beginning of the, of the, um, of the lockdown. And we were push, pushing people apart. And some people complained about us walking around with the cameras. We weren't necessarily taking photographs of them. So there is a kind of, Suspicion and again a renewed um, yeah suspicion about what is a photograph, what's it doing, especially now with all these di different social media platforms. Yeah, I'm aware of this, and there's one thing which has happened of late. Some people apparently have been taking photographs of women from um, below so that they can see their uh, into into their pants and so on, and then posting them on the social media. I didn't even know about this, and there's even petitions trying to stop this. Huh? So I'm always careful. One thing I'm very, very careful about is photographing children. Yeah. 
because um, then again, child abuse always, so I'm very, very careful. No, oh, that's very fascinating. Mm -hmm. uh, so the next question is from Catherine Dale. She writes, my question is, do you have an idea in your head about what subject you are looking for on a particular day? And have you been able to take images of the current circumstances of the last few months of so the coronavirus? Um, I try to be as open as possible. I don't, I try not to have um, ideas in my head or in, <laughs> within me when I set out. But um, I do realize certain things draw me, like um, the, the writings on the wall, the graffiti and so on. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm very interested in, in um, crossroads, um, traffic nodal points where lo a lot of buzz is happening. You know? I sometimes stay there for an hour or two, seeing what is happening and sometimes take, take an image. Yeah? In this present lockdown, COVID, now, now a little bit here, post COVID time, I still have been going out on my wanderings also, of course, with social distancing, it's a very, for me, a very interesting time because the pace of the cities, uh, I mean, here in Berlin, has slowed down. And it's a slowing down, which I really like, because I really, I wander very slowly. I take time, I look, so now I can see better even more. And um, that's why I, I, one particular day of the week where I really like w w um, wandering and working is Sunday. Hmm. So, Many, many days prior to this particular, now it's getting a bit more um, um, busy again. But at the beginning of the lockdown, it was almost like every day was a Sunday. So I enjoyed that time. Well, the piece that um, we acquired from the museum was easy like Sunday morning. Is that, does that tie into that as well? A little bit, a little bit. I particularly like the song. And also um, there's a kind of, Within the cities, especially, a kind of, especially, I noticed this even in Chicago too, is a kind of um, relaxed atmosphere, especially for the women. Now they, I mean, they can have, they have time for their families, for their kids, for their husband, for the house, for what they have to do at home, but for the men as well, away from work. And then sometimes they like, I mean, in the States, they go to the ballpark or they watch a game or something. And, but they also hang with each other. So it's a, it's a different vibe. Huh? But each day of the week has its own special vibe. So I try to be attuned to all these different vibes all the time. Great. So the next question is a three-parter. It says, uh, what, lead, what led you to move to Germany over 50 years ago? And the other follow-up questions are, other than Berlin, what other cities have you lived in in Germany? And how would you describe your life in Germany? Um, I came to Germany to study. Actually, I wanted to do a doctorate. I never did it because I got into photography. I'm halfway on, on the road. And um, then I got married, had two lovely daughters, actually three, because my, my former wife came with a daughter. So I just stayed in Germany. I don't have any particular um, difficulty staying in Germany then until now because I was born in Britain, but I grew up in Nigeria. So it's not really of much of... Um, not so much of a difficulty for me. And um, I came to, um, to Germany and I was studying in Heidelberg. It's a small town actually, so I, st I started there. And then in the 80s, I moved to Munich where when my marriage broke up. So I lived in Munich for about eight years. And ever since then, for about 30 years now, just, just over 30 years, I've been living in Berlin. Now. I was telling somebody today, actually, Berlin is the only city in Germany where I really feel comfortable. It's the most um, cosmopolitan, if one can say that. And it's actually the city where a lot of Germans come to from other parts of the provinces of Germany, and they subtly change. They become more, actually, it's not Berlin, but they realize that their home, so, uh, so the way they behaved in their provinces doesn't fully work here. So they change it subtly. And so I like this a lot. So this is why, especially I like cities where you have a kind of buzz and intermingling, which you don't get often in the provinces or in the countryside. Yeah, that's certainly true and true in Chicago as well. Mm -hmm. um, so our last question is, I think there's two parts to this. Could you please discuss what you mean when you say, I am not a street photographer, but I'm a wanderer. And could you also discuss the possibilities slash constraints for wandering and image making in public space? 
And he also clarifies public spaces in different urban public spaces that span the globe. So the, um, in the past, some people wrote about me or my work and brought up Baudelaire. And Baudelaire, the French poet writer, speaks about the flaneur. And um, I in, intuitively dislike this um, particular concept because it's more of the stroller, mm. somebody who has leisure time and takes his time in looking into what is happening in the city. Yeah? So chilling, watching people looking into sh um, shop windows, at the railway station, at the airports. I too do this. So I do realize I have something of that in me, the flan this flan um, strolling, but it's more a conscious wandering. I want to really stress this. I much prefer the idea of being a hunter. So mm -hmm. going out, hunting, or hunting again is a bit, sometimes can become a bit aggressive. So, but looking for images, huh? mm. looking for, for the manifestations of the threads which suddenly come into being. Huh? Okay, that's what I'm really about. So it's a very conscious um, will thing. It's, it's um, a European concept in some ways of the, for, um, the wanderer who sets out every day wandering. Huh? He has his, um, his backpack, his, his walking stick or his, yeah, his walk. And he just wanders in, out into the, um, not, not just into the landscape, but from city to city, from, de from one um, location to the next. Uh, and I love doing this. I wanted to say something that I'm a sucker for the next corner. Mm. So when, whenever I'm out on the, on, the, on the road, after about six, eight hours, I can do this quite easily. I say to myself, now nah, I, must, I must go home, I must stop. But there's another corner in the distance. I must see what's beyond that. So the next corner keeps on calling me. Okay, first of all, that. Secondly, um, public space varies from city to, so for, yeah, from geographical space to geographical. Some places are much easier to photograph than others. So I try to go with the flow. Mm. One city which is very, and still is very difficult for this kind of photography is Lagos, Nigeria. People are very aggressive, can be very aggressive. And especially when I was younger, I could hardly sometimes take photographs. As soon as I bring out the camera, people start you know, saying they, they are going to smash the camera. What am I doing? I'm making money out of them, using their images to sell. So, so I try to explain that to them. But over the years, I've been much more accepted, as I've, especially as I've got older, got gray hair. People accept me much more now. There's a lot of respect. Also my camera, which is not, not digital, but analog, and is not so invasive. And then um, since I've been doing it for about 30, 40 years now, I learn what, what the Americans call streetwise. So I'm not aggressive. And I'm also, I, I don't try to, I'm not a fly on the wall, but people, re most people, are, uh, especially in the so-called developing world, they realize what I'm about. I'm wandering, taking, making images. And in Sao Paulo, in, in um, Dakar, Senegal, people really respect this. No, no problem, do it. Huh? Obviously, not, not everywhere. I mean, some things you can't, like, um, you know, uh, criminality, drug dealing, um, yeah, people, um, other things, you know, I'm careful about that. And also, I have a lot of difficulty photographing the homeless people. Huh? But it was so bad in Sao Paulo, I got into it again because it was terrible. People were sometimes literally naked on the street and people were just walking past as if, as if they didn't even exist. I said, this can't be like this. And I started photographing this again, I'm doing it here too, but other parts of the world. So it's, it's a learning process and each of us is so individual. I can't give any rules or regulations to others, huh? but I believe in respect. And um, I don't, not, I don't, I'm not in, in your face. Huh? Yeah. So, so I don't try to be invasive in that kind of way. Yeah, I hope well, that's, that's a good really... enough answer, yeah. Mm -hmm. What? I hope that's a good enough answer. No, I think that's an excellent answer and I think that's a great place to end on. Um, so that's all of our questions, but thank you so much for joining us today and for giving us this really interesting walk through your work and your career. It's been really interesting and enlightening. And I know a lot of the people in the chat have been very excited by it as well. So uh, I really appreciate it. And thank you again. Thank you very much, Marissa. Very, I'm very grateful for your, um, um, how do you call it, um, um, taking care of, of me and of us. <laughs>
And thank you too to everybody who, who, who listened in and all for the questions, very, very insightful questions. Thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you very much. Bye-bye then. Bye. Bye.